This is one of my favourite sonatas for solo unaccompanied bass. It's Arbel's G Major Sonata from the Countess of Pembroke's Notebook and we're going to look at the first movement. We'll look at the others later on because they're all brilliant. Um, and considering it's unaccompanied and Arbel, it's actually relatively playable. So right at the very beginning, several things. You've got to make sure you catch both strings equally and together at the beginning. We're not aiming to spread that chord two notes so you can catch them both at the same time. When you go up for the crotchet, I would play it on the top string rather than the four because I think there's something really nice about having all three notes in that opening G major chord on different strings. So I'm holding down the first chord and crossing to the top with the bow, but you can still hear all that resonance of the first chord carrying on under the crotchet. And only now am I going to move my first finger to play that next chord. Then I'm going to move one and two, but then I'm going to add my three instead of hopping the second finger over to play the first chord of the third bar. So I'm going for the smoothest line that I can between bar two and bar three. If you were going to be ridiculous about it, you could actually use different fingers for all of those. It would be excellent fingering. I think it is slightly unnecessary. I think it's fine to move your first finger across. But then I really would go for the three here. Hold it down. So you use the same finger for the C at the beginning of bar three as you do for the quavers. And then this one, you can bar the D to the F sharp and then add your second finger for the G at the start of bar four. So for me, I need to get my hand into the right shape to bar successfully and then think about adding the two. I think if I'm going for the G and the D, then I'm not in the right place to play the F sharp behind it. So you've got to work out how to get your first finger to lie flat across that fret so you're going to get a good sound on the D in the F sharp and add your second finger in. And the advantage of that is that it really helps to keep the minim in, in that fourth bar. The bottom note, the D, is a minim with two crotchets that change pitch over the top. But you need to keep your bow on both strings so you don't end up with just the F sharp on its own because you miss the whole point of that harmony, the fourth resolving to the third. So just make sure you keep your bow on both strings and then the third crotchet of that bar, that's on its own. And I think it can be quite a weak sound because the next one is a new start, isn't it? So we're going for... it needs to be weak and then we're the same chord as we were at the beginning really crucial here that your bow doesn't see I think sometimes I see a rising line and I'm really conscious that my bow is sort of trying to change strings sort of trying to oh it's getting higher I must need to be climbing up the instrument and actually it doesn't go anywhere does it the top note rises and the bass line falls, in terms of bowing, you're playing the same two strings between the first chord of that bar and the second chord. So just watch that this arm doesn't change its angle at all. 
You can use totally different fingers for each chord. One and two on the first one. Three for the C sharp and open E. And now you've got a one to put on the F sharp at the bottom. And you have to spread that chord, three notes. Unless you want to go for a real crunch, it's really quite dramatic. It doesn't seem to me to fit the character of the piece. So I would spread that three note chord. I think that's fine. Nice lazy triplets. Hold the one down here. Just for the sake of the harmony, don't take that off as soon as you've played it. Start the trill on the upper note and play a nice long appoggiatura. How long do you dare sit on that F sharp for? Before you start the trill. And it's a slow movement, this, isn't it? It's very beautiful, it's very expansive. It does not need a trill. It sounds like somebody's burglar alarm going off and is just terrifying. So a trill. It starts slowly, and I would tuck a little appoggiatura in at the end of it, um, largely actually, to buy myself a bit of time to find the bottom of the next chord. If you try and go straight from the E, down there, got a long way to go and absolutely no time to get there, but if you just end your trill, with anticipation and the open string, you've got time to find that last chord. Does that make sense? So from bar five, I've got good quality bass note in that last bar. It's such beautiful writing, isn't it? Let's play from bar five to the end of that section. Bar five, two, three. From the top then. There's a slightly more um, awkward couple of bars at the beginning of this. So here's another one where the bass note is a minim. And I think it's tempting, but I really don't think you can squash your first finger to give you the second crotchet because it's really going to interfere with the bass note. It's very tempting to put a one on the B, open the top string, and then think, well, I'll just squash that into a bar. But it's just, it kind of interferes, doesn't it? bottom note you lose the quality of it. So I'd use your second finger. Having done that, really we've got to use the three for the F. And so now we've got to use one and four. It is slightly awkward fingering that. I don't really have a better way. You might experiment second finger. I just think it's a bit intrusive. We've got four fingers, we might as well use them, mightn't we? So with that, keeping the B sounding and adding your second finger in. So moving really seamlessly to the F natural with a three and then the one and the four. And while you're there, you can bar that one onto the top string for the E. There's plenty of time and plenty of space to do that. And then we're all right, aren't we? Now we're back into ordinary first position. Think that chord um, at the start of the one, two, three, fourth bar of the second section. My edition doesn't have any numbers in it. Um, the F sharp and the A. The F sharp is the bottom of the line that was the triplets. 
that's just going to carry on down there, isn't it? Yeah. And you happen to have an A just added onto the top. Just add it in really elegantly. I think the risk in there is that you, you go on playing one string at a time, I'm playing one string at a time, and now I'm playing two strings. Think of it as just seamlessly moving into the F sharp and happening to catch the A1 over there. I don't, again, I don't think you should spread it, but um, I don't think you need to announce the fact that you're suddenly playing two strings. Should we just try that out from the beginning of the section? It is slightly, slightly awkward. I think it's the most awkward bit of the whole piece. You'll be pleased to know it doesn't get any worse than that. Second section. Two, three. I should have said actually, I'm really conscious in there that when I'm making space to fit my second finger in here, I think my thumb then at the back of the at the back of the fingerboard then moves quite a long way to accurately support my fourth finger. So I think the thumb is coming up the fingerboard because of these two fingers. But when I get, if I'm in that position, then I really can't reach that four very accurately. So suddenly my thumb comes much further down the fingerboard to be able to reach the G sharp with the four across there. So here, there's quite a pivot going on. There's plenty of time to do it while you're playing that chord. But if your fingers work like mine, they're not going to reach from back here. You just need to bring them round a bit. Here's the start of that section once more. Two, three. Come round. looking at the one, two, three, fourth bar from the last two crotchets which are slurred together. One and two on that chord. I mean you've got a couple of options here, neither of which are perfect. If you've got that B and G with a one and a two, if you want to use different fingers you have to have a three on the C. But then can't really play the D on the same string. So you have to slow across, which is not ideal. It's not ideal because it really changes the quality of the sound. It would be nicer if the pair of crotchets that were slurred together were on the same string. But it's really not nice because you're then going to play the same note at the top of the next chord. And I think they need to have the same quality. I think it is the same note that is changing with a changing harmony underneath it, but I think it's a pity if those two Ds are of different quality. So what I'm actually going to do is move my second finger to play the C with a two, and then slur to the four, and then keep the four at the start of the next chord. I think it's okay as long as you dare while you move the two over. The, the pity of it is that you miss, you, as soon as you take the bass note off, you miss that G is going to disappear when you move your second finger over to play the C. Move it as late as you dare and make the B as melodic as you possibly can. But I think that's the best way of negotiating those couple of bars. So then we're four with an open string to two and one. Same two fingers, swap over. There's no other way of doing it. And now you've got the G down at the start of the next chord. Open C string, second finger G, open string A. And I think here, it's a three note chord, but if you finish just on the A string, 
you miss the most glorious crunch, which gets resolved there. So I think you need to hear that. I would finish on both of those strings simultaneously. And here again, it's that barring with your first finger. Keeping the bottom note sounding for a minute, making the top note into a whole crotchet's worth of a quadratura. Let's go from the fourth bar of that second section, but for the last two crotchets. So we're starting on a back bow, plenty of bow, two, three, one. like the beginning. like the start of the piece. Isn't it? that it doesn't just, that it hasn't cleared by the time you start the top of this. Part of the beauty of that bar is this harmony, with that D over the top. I think there's not much time to spread this, really, you're on your way to the top, aren't you? This bit is just to get you to the top of these triplets. So don't spend hours over the first chord of that um, three bars from the end. I don't think there's time. No time for that. I don't think it takes the drama away from the top. And then here's another three note chord where you really need to hear the top two notes together to get the effect of the dissonance to appreciate that and the trill just works with your first finger barred across D to F sharp and your two for the top of the, of the trill wiggle your second finger and there we are Let's do that last phrase. So this is the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight final bars of the piece, starting like it does at the beginning. Two, three. key isn't it G major it just has such resonance within the instrument shall we play the whole lot through we'll do both both repeats and um, play it with me if you if you like but then play it on your own the whole point of these things is that you're free to express it and to take time wherever you wish so don't just be constrained by playing it along with me and um, play it to get the shape of it and then do your own thing with it and that's fine from the top both repeats do you? Three. 